So we, we started talking about Revelation last week and kind of a twofold reason why I did that. Um, one is we're just going into the season of Advent and believe it or not, Advent is also about the second coming of Christ. It's being ready and prepared and waiting on him to return. So we, our theme was, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And today's title is This Is Us. Next slide, please. So we love we love fall. We have 1.2 days of it in Arkansas. <laughs> we do. <laughs> How many days look like that? They're nice and pretty. Today's one of those days. We have winter briefly. Now we're back in the fall for a minute. But the reason I put that up there is because to my way of thinking, in all of time, on God's calendar, we are in the fall. This is where we are. The leaves are starting to fall. Something tremendous is going to happen at some point, and it's all going to change in a blink of an eye. And this has been this would be to me where we are today. Not all the leaves are on the ground, not everything's happening yet, it's going to happen. But at some point, winter's going to happen, and then there's going to be a new birth and a new day. And it's just and it's going to be 180 degrees. Be like, like not like anything that's ever happened before. But next slide, sweet. So I'm going to use this scripture because today's theme kind of is we're going to heaven, and we're going to talk about our rewards, and that's what Revelation is partly about. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So, next slide. I want you to see that. We're going to talk about the seven-sealed scroll. And before I get off and over, we'll talk about that. I just want you to visualize that. You know, today, when we have technology, we... Uh, we encrypt something. That's how we make something secure. We we scramble it in such a way that if somebody wants to read it, you got to have the code key to break it on the other side to, to read it. What they did in Roman days, if it was a last will and testament particularly, they put seven seals on it. And, and in that way, you knew if whatever that document was had been tampered with because you could not put it back like that without be, being made aware that somebody had looked at this, somebody had opened it up. And so today is again the scripture, which is a lot. Um, you're going to find that Christ will open the seven seals, and, and it basically is the last will and testament of planet Earth, and God is giving planet Earth to Jesus Christ, who was rightfully gained it from the beginning. So that's like the simplest, get you started kind of thing, so you understand what's going on. Um, I'm going to deviate a minute because I had a couple questions so I'll, this, about last week's sermon, and, and then you know, people, a lot of people don't like the Bible study thing I'm doing right now. That's okay. Uh, I just want you to get through Revelation with me because a lot of people are afraid of Revelation. It's very important to me that you get through it and you get it. It's so important. God said it's the only book of the Bible, both beginning and end, says it'll bless your life, it will change you, it'll be a part of you. So just, I'm trying to bless you. I'm not doing it. To, Torture you, maybe torture a little bit, but you know. But anyway, so, but I brought up this thing about opposites, and and it, it, and some very faithful people that I care about questioned that a little bit because it was interesting. And for you, those of you that weren't here, I gave some examples of big opposites and like, what's the opposite of big? What's the opposite of big? Small, right? Very simple. And I asked the opposite of God, and. Some people jumped up and said, the devil. And as I said earlier, in that particular sermon, I talked about the fact that the devil is not the opposite of God. The devil is actually the opposite of Michael. And even that's kind of a stretch. And I got to thinking about that more this week. And I want you to describe um, Michael and Satan or Lucifer or Beelzebub or whatever you want to call him. I want to describe him in a little bit different terms so that you can see that he's not an opposite of God. And um, the, because I believe God has angels that have specific jobs, very specific jobs. And this is where it gets kind of humorous to me. Michael was made to be a warrior. That was his job, period. I mean, he is the ultimate warrior. There's nobody like him. 
He's it. Satan, on the other hand, was made to be beautiful, to reflect God's beauty. He was made to be someone who would, would take God's magnificence, God's beauty, God's holiness, and reflect it to the world. Okay? Does that sound like what a Christian is supposed to do, by the way? In some ways, he was the very first ultimate Christian. He was supposed to reflect God's light and share it with people. But then something happened. He got full of pride. He got full of himself because he was beautiful. And he thought, you know what? I can be like God. I, I, can, I, can, I can do what God, I want to be like God. I want to do what God can do. Do you remember that happened in the Garden of Eden? Same thing, right? So I, I have to laugh because when you put something very beautiful, and, and, I, and, I, and to put it in very modern terms, Satan is a very good community organizer. He's good at bringing people along and joining his way and his path. That's his job. And he takes his beauty and his ability to blend in and whatever, and he, and he affects people's lives. Michael, on the other hand, he brings the sword to the party. That's all he knows. He knows truth, justice, and a sword. And so I want you to picture this. You've got Michael on this side with his sword, and you've got a really pretty guy over here. Who do you think is going to win that battle? A guy who is set up to manipulate and coerce people, or a guy who was born to fight? I just want you to understand that. So that's, that is why the devil is not the opposite of God. That is why the devil is something, an entity that God created and then went the wrong direction later. Okay? Is that been kind of the opposite thing? And I just want you to, Lucifer literally means bright morning star. So he was supposed to be the ultimate, shiny, wonderful, and he just went the wrong way with that. So that's a way off subject today, other than the fact that we're going to talk about the end of time. Uh, next slide, sweetie. Let's see where we are. Okay, we're in the book. But uh, forgive me today, we're going to fly as quickly as we can. Um, the introduction, real quickly, is what where we ended last week. I counsel thee to buy of me, this is Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. If you want to follow along, I found out the people that were following along got it a whole lot more than people who just, and if you don't have your Bible, well, there may be some around somewhere or going with a friend, but it just it's easier to keep up with if you travel that way. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich in white raiment, that thou may be clothed, and that the sh shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes have, and thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand and knock at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome, and sat down with my Father in his throne. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. And that's where we ended last week. So we talked about the churches, we talked about having spiritual ears to hear the message that God is trying to tell you. And what it's saying there is that if you hear that message, you will wear a white robe and you'll end up in heaven and you'll be in a better place. Okay, fast forward a whole lot. There's chapter 3, between there and chapter 4, where rapture happens. And okay, now we're all in heaven. Those of us who just did what they just said. Those who believe and those who worship God and those who understand who God is and, and accepted Christ, they now have white robes and crowns, and you need to kind of wrap all that in here. We sing all those songs, we sang them today, all about heaven. We, and, we, and we kind of have a hard time with that, don't we? Because it's kind of outside of our wheelhouse to understand something like that. So I, I want to get it kind of where it's as simple as it can be. Okay, so chapter 4, we start off in heaven. Here we go. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, was there of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that much, which must be hereafter. All the stuff that we read earlier was in the present. This is now future. This is, this is revelation. This is the mystery of what's going to happen at any time happening as we speak. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And when it says set in heaven, that means that's God's throne. It's not a changing throne. It's set forever. It's permanent. It's God's. There's nobody else going to take it. It is what it is. Jump down to verse 4. And around the throne were four and twenty seats, 
And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. That is us, folks. That is the church sitting in heaven. This is, this is reward. This is, this is us wearing our crowns, wearing our white raiment. This is, this is the church. That's who they're talking about. Jump down to verse 8. By the way, what is heaven's job? What is our job? What is heaven? What, is, what do they do in heaven all day long? Anybody? Praise God. God. Worship? Worship. Praise? Worship? Okay. I mean, that's it. Exactly. That is heaven's job. So here we go. Verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That's, that's our God. And, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him, and they sit on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him, and that sit on the throne, and worship him, that liveth forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. By the way, that's where that group got their name from, casting crowns. You know that group? Some of you guys do. So, we, you know, they're worshiping, and they take their crowns off, and they throw them up on the throne, almost like a, Lord, we know you're the king. You gave us crowns, but you know what? You're the king. You're the ultimate ruler. We're so glad we're here. We're so glad we can worship you. We're so glad we're together with you now, finally. This is, this is what this is about. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive the glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. Now, we just talked about the seven seals. We're about to get to that. You saw what that looked like. Last will and testament. This is chapter 5. And I saw in him the right hand of that set on the throne a book with written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Now me, I say that's Michael because we just talked about Michael. He's bad as a bone. He's strong. That's who I think he is. Who is worth, and he says, Who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found. John is crying. Because nobody can open this book. No man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And then one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. Okay, now this is the imagery stuff, and I'm going to explain. Seven horns, the horn is considered to be the power of an animal. So this is Jesus Christ in full power, and seven eyes is considered to be wisdom, so that's full wisdom. So Jesus Christ being in full of power and full of wisdom, let's talk in modern English, and he has the, the qualities of the seven spirits of God, which we talked about before, which we kind of know what those are, the Holy Spirit. And what, what, what does the Holy Spirit give us? Those skills, that skill set. So this person, Christ, has all of this power, all of this wisdom, and has these sevenfold uh, spirits, not spirits, the ability of the seven spirits, of the, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get tongue tied here. Okay. And then worship begins here. It says, And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new psalm, which we did today. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed to us God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. This is not the Jewish people. This is the church. Every tongue, every people, every kindred, every nation, people from all over the world are praising God. And he has made us unto our God's kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We are his priests, by the way, right? We know this. We're a heavenly priesthood, all of us. So the worship begins because he, the one who was able to open the scroll is Christ, and they're excited, and they're happy in heaven. Look, and they're also happy because it's finally going to happen. You've got to realize some of these people have been up there for centuries waiting for this to happen, for this day. Think about that. I mean, they've been up there for centuries waiting and waiting and, 
and they know this is what prophecy says is going to happen, and they're waiting, and they're sitting there going, when is this, when are you going to, when are you going to take care of this evil person on planet Earth who's doing all this? When, when are you going to do all that? And then, and then the Lamb receives his inheritance. And I beheld and heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such that are in the sea and all that there is in them heard us saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So they're worshiping Christ, because now it's about to happen. Things are about to start. Now we get to the point where we start to open the scroll. And this is when tribulation begins. And this is the full horse of the apocalypse, if you know the story. And there's not a lot of verses about the fourth horse of the apocalypse, but a lot of stories about it. Here we go. And I saw when the Lamb opened up one of the seals, and I heard, as it was were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts say, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So this is a conqueror. The interesting part of this is he had a bow, and he had no arrows. There will be a false peace on the earth, on the world at that time. In other words, this person will have so much influence that they'll be able to cause peace over planet earth without firing a single shot. Think about that for a minute. It is a false peace. You can kind of back this up with Daniel if you want to go read that. But anyway, now let's go to the second seal open. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. The power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given him a great sword. Now this is war. So you have false peace, then you got war. Now this is interesting. Isn't that how the devil works? He lures you into false sense of security. Everything's okay. It's all good. Everything's going to be fine. And then you have the greatest war of all time to take place because people are not ready. People are not really ready for this to happen. Now the third seal is open. What happens after war? Famine. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And beheld, I beheld a, a, a low, a black horse. And he said on him, I had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice say in the midst of the four beasts, say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou not hurt the oil and the wine. There will be a worldwide famine because a day's wages will not buy enough food to eat. The interesting thing in that little thing, it says, Do not hurt the oil and the wine. That was the rich man's food. So there will be the extreme situation where there will be people who have oil and wine, and people who can't afford to eat by the bazillions, I'll just say it like that. So that'll be the common. The common, the common folks will be starving to death after this war. The fourth seal is open. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. Now we have death, because after you have war and you have famine, you have death. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name was only said was death, and hell, and hell followed with him, and the power was given unto him to, over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death with the beast of the earth. And now the fifth seal. And he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So we have martyrs, people who were killed for the word of God, who are standing under the altar waiting on the day of the Lord. They're waiting. They got their white robes on. They've been waiting all this time. They're ready for the end of time. And this is what God says. And they cried with a loud, loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should all be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, until every last person that's martyred for the word of God, they're going to have to wait. Sixth seal. And I beheld him when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was an earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. 
And this is hell on earth, folks. This is when it all starts. And the stars of the heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast its like untimely fins when shaken by the wind. Think about it, you shake a fig tree and all the figs fall down. All the stars are going to fall out of the sky. I mean, just, it's just going to be utter chaos. And then the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. You ever think about a Venetian blind? You pull that thing and it just goes like that. Can you imagine the heavens just rolling back like that? I mean, that's just, just think about that for a minute. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So the whole place is just utter chaos. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every fine man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And they said in the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide from us the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. They know who it is. They know why it's coming. We all do, you know? The whole world might not want to accept who Jesus Christ is. They might not want to accept what's going to happen. But when that day comes, there'll be some believers. <laughs> that's just all I'm saying. And, and that's the thing about Revelation as you go through it. Yes, it sounds horrible, but there are so many second chances still. God wants every person not to go to hell. And he keeps giving them chances. You'll see that as we go through this. But the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who can stand against God? No one. But wait, there's still hope. This is the part that has caused most so much chaos. This is the 144,000. And this is basically 144,000 Jewish people from every tribe. And basically it says 144,000 men, so I'm assuming 144,000 males of every tribe, 12,000 of each, um, who were not married, who were, I mean, just there's a lot to it. But And they're going to become the world's evangelists. So God has sent this horrible bunch of plagues, if you want to call it that, and everybody's scared, the whole world's falling apart. And so what does he send next? 144 thousand spirit-filled evangelists so these people have a chance to get out of this. You get it? He gives them a shot. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth and the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea nor on any tree and I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels and the man who was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees so we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And there's 12,000 from each tribe. We'll jump all the way down to verse 9. Well, actually, yeah, verse 9. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude. Now here's what the deal is. Verse 9, these are the people who were saved by the preaching of the 144,000. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and cried in a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The 144,000 evangelists went and preached to a world that was on fire and burning and just crazy stuff going on. And guess what? You can be a pretty effective preacher with that going on. I'm just saying. I mean, in that situation. And all the angels stood around the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence they came from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and said unto me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are people who had not made a decision for Christ. They were living in wickedness. They were totally as far away as they could be and all this started to happen and they changed. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and that he sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. There shall be no hunger no more. Bad language there. Neither thirst any more, neither shall there be sunlight on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb is which in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And now we get to the seventh seal. That's chapter 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Some people think that proves there's no women in heaven. 
They probably just go, Dark says that. Ah. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer that was given unto him. You know why there was, you know why there was silence, by the way? Because this was it. Worship stopped. That seventh seal was opened. You get it, right? I mean, this, this is it. These people have been waiting for thousands of years, and they know when the seventh seal is open, it's, it's over. I mean, the way things are, the way things have been, everything changes at this moment. So they're like, total silence. Total silence. Because they, this is the great day of the Lord. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came from the prayers of the saints ascended up before God and out of the angel's hand. Think about our prayers. Our prayers, our cumulative prayers of all time are being offered now because, guess what? It's judgment day. They're gonna, they're gonna, it, it, is, it is what glorifies God is our prayer. Think about that. Our prayers from all of eternity are taking like smoke and they're like, and they're part of, and they're praising God and he's going to go and do this magnificent thing. I mean, this entire book is fantastic. People want to be afraid of it. There's no reason to be afraid of it if you're on the right side of it. This is us. This is what we're called to be. This is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now we have seven angels and seven trumpets. And what you'll figure out with the sevens, obviously, is every time that's a completion of something, and usually the seventh thing, whatever it might be, is almost like a, a conclusion and a, and, a, and, a, and a completeness, but also almost like a, a, I don't know, a, a reminder of all the rest of it that happened, basically. The first angel sounded, and they were falling hail mingled with blood, and it was cast on the earth. And this, is, this is interesting. And I'll go through these the way I did the others with the horses. This is about vegetation. And you think about killing all the vegetation, what would happen? Don't we lose our oxygen supply? I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to killing food. I mean, there's a lot to it. But the first, the first trumpet, the first angel sounded, and this was followed by hail and fire mingled with blood, and there was cast on the earth. The third part of the trees were burned up, and all the grasses burned up. The second trumpet is about salt water or the sea. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures were in the sea, and the head, head life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Think about all the smell from that. A third of the world's oceans have dying, rotting animals just floating around. Pretty awful stuff. Now we're going to get to the third trumpet, and this is fresh water, which is probably much more bothersome to us. We live inland. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell the third part of the rivers upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third of the part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So we have some sort of asteroid or whatever hit the water system, and all our water is ruined. And it's a bad day, folks. It's a bad day. Now the fourth trumpet is probably the strangest one to me because it messes with time. Time gets all messed up. Everything is just weird. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the, third, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So think about that, okay? Take a third part of the night away, and take a third part of the day away. Makes for a very strange day. Our, our cycles will get all messed up. Our calendar's all messed up. There's no regular schedule to anything anymore. And I beheld a herd of angel flying from the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of their other voices and trumpets to the three angels which are yet to sound. So this angel is saying, Look, you think this is bad? Here's what's coming. You think this is bad? So here comes the fifth trumpet. And this is where it gets interesting. Our buddy Lucifer, we mentioned him earlier, he falls to the earth. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given the power of scorpions on the earth to have power. There are demons everywhere. 
I mean, there's a cloud of demons block out the sun. I mean, there's demons just running amok all over planet Earth because Lucifer has been thrown into the pit and for the first time there are bound demons that have been now for thousands of years have turned loose and let go. Just to, just to have complete havoc on planet Earth. Think about that. Pretty bad stuff, right? And it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. It's a bad day to be a non-Christian. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. We talked about wasps before lunch, before church this morning, didn't we? Scorpions are worse. I've been stung with like ten wasps. You know, think about that. You're getting stung for five months. You can't, there's, you can't kill yourself. It's not going to happen. You can't find any relief. And in those days, men shall seek death, shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were unlike, and the horses prepared into battle. I'll skip that part. We'll keep on down. We don't need the imagery. We know the story. Verse 10, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and they had power to hurt men for five months. And they had a king over them. This is the important part which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. Both of those mean destroyer, by the way. One woe is past, and behold, two more woes to come. And he cried, and I have a, hang on, I got a verse missing. Verse 12. Somebody ate page nine. Oh boy. Hold on. Right, we have the wing now. We'll get a Bible now. We can do that. <laughs> Y'all know where Revelation is? sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is for God, and it said to the sixth angels who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who bound the Euphrates River. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this hour and this day and the month and year were released to kill one-third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice ten thousand times ten thousand, and I went and heard their number. The horses and riders saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark, and blue, yellow, sulfur. We're not getting into all that. But basically, a third of the earth is going to be killed. And the rest, and here, here's the most important part of that, verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood. Idols they could not see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, and their thefts. Okay, the whole world's going to hell. Everything, everybody's being killed left and right. And some people are still so hard headed, hard hearted actually, that they will not repent. They will not give it up. And in, in reality, people don't understand that Revelation is God trying to reach people. He's trying one last time to get their attention. He, you know that old song, you had me a hello? He had me a hello. I mean, when, when any of this starts to happen, I'm like, I'm in. I don't want to be here for this. Chapter 10. And then I saw another day. My face was like the sun in heaven, and his legs were like fire colors. Well, the this is like the one moment of, of uh, peace, I guess you'd say here. And he was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a shout like a roar of a lion. And he shouted, and the voice of the seven thunder spoke, and the seven thunder spoke. I was about to write it, but I heard a voice from heaven say, you need to listen to this. Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. 
what people say about this verse is, what is going to happen to those people who are not Christians is so horrendous they didn't even want to put it in the Bible. They did not want that mystery to be revealed. They, in other words, do not share with these people what is going to happen to them if they don't repent. Okay? It's a mystery. It's the one relating mystery that they don't explain in their revelations. They don't want to tell you how bad it actually is going to be. And then I saw an angel standing on the sea and in the hand and land, raising his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that's in them, and be no more delayed. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished. In other words, the mystery they just talked about, the mystery of what's going to happen to people, how bad it's going to be, will be accomplished when the seventh trumpet sounds. And then here's the interesting part, and I'm going to jump way ahead. John is offered the scroll. This is Jesus holding this little tiny scroll. And he said, Take and eat it, and it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. What he's saying is, is the prophecy, the prophecy of God's kingdom coming to pass is wonderful, and it's amazing, and it's awesome that we're going to have crowns, and we're going to have white robes, and we're going to live in heaven forever and ever. But the judgment, Thinking about all those who do not believe, all those who are going to suffer, it's bitter. It's a bittersweet moment, you know, realizing what's going on. And that's John. And of course he tells them, you must prophesy against the many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And now I'm going to finish with this last part, which is pretty fantastic. Chapter 11. What if you had superpowers? Seriously. Can you imagine having superpowers? These are two Preachers with superpowers. God gives them an amazing gift. Chapter 11. And there was given to me a reed unto like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and to them worship therein. But the court which is in the holy temple leave out and measure it not, before it is given to the Gentiles. The holy city shall be tread underfoot for forty-two and two months. Forty and two months. And here we go. Verse 3, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. So we've got these two people on planet Earth, and this is important. These people are known worldwide. These two people are known worldwide at this point in time. They are, they are evangelists. The world has fallen apart. A lot of people have died. There's been a lot of suffering. And these guys are preaching the gospel every day, and they are not liked. Let me just say that. They are People that don't believe the way they believe and have not been saved are going to do their best to try to kill them. And it's interesting because you you have to imagine what the news reports must be like at this point in time. And the only time that this could have happened in history is here going forward because, as I read here in just a minute, you realize that the only way that people all over planet Earth could see would be when they have cell phones or the news media or some way to see these people. But anyway, so... These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Okay, I'm preaching a sermon, you don't like it? You're done. Okay, I mean, think about that. I mean, if there's somebody trying to hurt me, trying to hurt me preaching God's word, I'll have the ability to just smoke you. I mean, like, wow, poof, you're gone. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must be killed in this manner. They have the power to shut heaven, that it not rain in the days of the prophecy, and they have the power over the waters to turn into blood and smite the earth with all the blood, plagues, as often as they will. So these guys can do everything that you remember from the story of Moses. They can make frogs appear, they can turn the water to blood, they can do all those things. So they're preaching, and if anybody wants to mess with them, or try to kill them, or harm them in any way, they can do these things. So can you imagine how hated they are in the world at this moment? They're two of the most hated people to ever walk the earth. And then when they had finished their testimony, the beast that sent it to the box, nobody could kill them, so when they finished their time and their testimony, God allowed the beast to come out of the pit and make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is Jerusalem, for your information. And all the people of the world will see these people lying in the street dead. Okay, so you got CNN up, and there is a camera pointing at these two dead people laying in the streets. Three and a half days they're laying there. Can you imagine a reporter, you know, 
watching that, talking about that. I mean, so it's, it's on the nightly news every night. The two witnesses were in, you know, they were in Lolo this week, and they were talking and preaching, and, and nobody listened, and a bunch of people got burned up. And you mean, just imagine that would be the only thing going on in the world at that time, and they would just be so hated. And, and the people, and the and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies put in grave. This is the modern era. They didn't bury them. They just left them on the street laying there. And here's the crazy part. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to each other because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So they're going to be so happy they're dead. They're going to, we're going to start having a you know, dead witnesses day. We're going to send presents to each other have a great time because they did and after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entered into them now here the cameras are still rolling the scene and think about that after three days God puts life back into them and they stood upon their feet can you imagine what the commentator went like with that can you imagine that seriously and great fear fell upon them which saw them they're back <laughs> and they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them come up hither and they ascended into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to God of heaven. And the second woe was passed, and behold, the third woe cometh. And now we're in the seventh trumpet. And this is where we're going to finish this week. This is my closing. This is our benediction. We'll read these scriptures. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Christ is reigning again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is happening as we speak. And the four and twenty-four elders, the church, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces, and they worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come. In the time of the dead, they should be judged, and thou that should give us reward unto thy servants, to the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, the small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. I'm sorry, that wasn't too long. It's 12:04. That's amazing. We got, we got, we got um, the rest of Revelation next week. I'm not trying to run you off because what I tell you, if you listen to all of it, there's a blessing in it for you. I think we all need a blessing, don't we? Amen. It gets pretty serious next week. I know that was pretty serious already, right? But did you notice? The thing I want you to take away from it, everybody wants to say, well, I want to read Revelation because there's all this death and hate and all these problems and stuff, but God is trying to get people's attention. And you know what? Every day he tries to get our attention too. He tries to make us aware of what's going on in the world, make us aware of all the people that are starving, make us aware of all the problems that we have, and, 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 and ask us to do something about it. And what a better week to do something about it than Thanksgiving, right? Think about your friends, your loved ones. Think about somebody who doesn't have a family to go to on Thanksgiving and invite them to yours. I mean, just, just think about those things. They, you know, there's a lot of blessing in this book, and I know there's a lot of imagery that we struggle to understand, and, and you've got to understand especially next week as we get into that part, um, think about poor old John. John's an old man. And John is seeing a vision of whatever year, let's call it 2050, I don't know what year it is, but you know what I'm saying, call it 2050. What would 2050 look like to somebody from Christ era? How do you describe that stuff? How do you make it make sense? How, you know, and so, and, and think about how hard it was on him to watch all this. I mean, you'd need psychotherapy after you watched all this stuff. I mean, it'd be hard. And if you'll notice, and especially next week, periodically God will give him a little break. He'll give him a little positive news, like the 144,000. You know, he, he gave us all that horrible stuff going on. It was all very scary. And they're like, oh, wait, here's 144,000 evangelists. And they're going to go out and they're going to be ultra successful. And thousands upon millions of people are going to be saved. Okay, I can deal with that for a moment. Oh, here we go again. We're back in all this crazy stuff where it's just insane and there's people bloodshed and and just craziness. But anyway, you just need to take away from that. You need a white robe and you need a crown. And the only place you're going to get it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Andrew and Father, we, we do love you and we are thankful. And, you know, 
we don't do it for the reward, or I hope we don't, we do it because we love you. The reward is a bonus. And Lord, I just ask you that if there are any here today that, that question their faith or don't know for sure that they are ready to receive a crown, Lord, touch their heart, help them to understand that you really do love them and you want them to be saved. Just like at the end times when those are so hard-headed and so hard-hearted that they won't hear your message, you do some things that are pretty incredible to make a point. And Lord, I just pray that we all get the point and come across and love you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.